If you witness a special numbering system using 666, then you've been left behind. Where did everyone go? And are they all right? You probably know someone who has disappeared. A wife, a husband, a child, a friend, and are wondering what has become of them. In that flash, all those that had accepted Jesus as their savior were caught up to meet Jesus in the air. They traded their earthly bodies for bodies that are perfect, imperishable, and immortal. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with three guests for the hour. In part one, the discussion considers life on earth after the rapture of believers. If someone you love will be left behind, we encourage you to stay tuned. In part two, there is a look at the book of Daniel and just why it is one of the Bible's most prominent books for our day. Here is today's programming. The first few minutes after the rapture will be a shock to all, and confusion, disaster, and chaos will ensue and be in control. After the initial shock of the rapture wears off and realization sinks in as to what has just happened, literally millions of people from all over the world who had previously heard the gospel but refused to accept God's gift of salvation at that time will likely fall to their knees and ask forgiveness and ask Jesus to be their Savior. More people are likely to be saved immediately after the rapture than at any other previous time in history. Millions will realize that they should not have procrastinated and that they should have accepted Christ into their hearts when they had the chance, but they let pride and a love for this world get in the way. Millions will likely realize that their crazy Christian friends, that they were always talking about the rapture, well, they weren't so crazy after all. Social media will be all abuzz like never before, frantically texting and tweeting, Are you there? And where are you? Hashtag rapture. Thousands of videos will be uploaded instantly, going viral, showing clips of people that suddenly vanished. Surveillance videos from all across the globe will be posted, showing the instant disappearance of millions. Every bulletin board, telephone pole, and streetlight pole will be covered with flyers asking, Have you seen this person? If the rapture has happened and you are one of the ones who had heard the gospel, but for whatever reason did not accept Christ as your Savior at that time, then before you watch any more of this video, pause it and do it right now. Do not delay any longer. The longer you wait as the tribulation progresses, the harder, if not nearly impossible, it will be later. Welcome to the program, folks. Say in part one of my programming, I am considering, quite frankly, it's a haunting theme, and that would be life after the rapture of believers. Now, many in my audience will be departing at that time, as Jesus calls his bride home, outlined in 1 Thessalonians, other places as well, talked about in John 14. But everyone listening to this program will be leaving someone they care about behind. And my ministry has been carrying a couple of products for those left behind. We're going to focus heavily on one of those this segment. And it's a book written specifically to those left behind titled, Missed the Rapture? Question mark. How to Overcome During the Great Tribulation. The authors are John Balch and James D. Young. You have heard me refer to this book occasionally because it's a tool that you can safely leave behind for those you love who are resisting your warnings that the hour is late. Millions will disappear and only God knows the timing of that event. You heard me say, probably for the last three months here on Understanding the Times, that something changed back on October the 7th, the day of Israel's second modern-day Holocaust. The last day's clock is, I believe, ticking more rapidly now. And no, that is not sensationalism. If you ever hear that on this program, I do invite you to tune me out. But I do believe that that day set the stage for a new phase in the last day's countdown. I'll reference that again throughout the hour. John Balch has been a pastor in the Portland, Oregon area. He is a graduate of Western Seminary in Portland. He is co-author of the book. Dr. James D. Young has been a professor of New Testament at Western Seminary for 40 years, now retired. 
and the author of many books, and he is, again, co-author of the book, Miss the Rapture? Question mark. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Hello, Jan. Yes, Jan. Thank you for inviting us. John, let me address this question to you. The book is written before the fact about something that is imminent, could happen any day. You rightfully say that it will be the most dramatic event in world history up until that point. Why don't you take a minute or two to describe what is going to happen for those that have no knowledge? The rapture, functionally, the term comes from a Latin translation of the original Greek term, which means to snatch away. It's God snatching away of all of those who have placed their faith in Christ. We believe scriptures make it very plain that this will occur immediately prior to, if not in actually inaugurating, the seven-year period wherein world government reigns supreme. The Antichrist comes to reign over the world system, but God also brings his divine judgments prior to the return of Christ to the earth to reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That disappearance is going to be sudden, without warning, and simultaneous at all points of the earth where believers may be found, but is going to leave the world in utter chaos. And I might add, it's going to leave world governments and communication systems scrambling for some sort of explanation Of course, the term is following the science as to what had happened. So it's been predicted for 2,000 years, yet James the Young, most churches remain silent about it. In fact, many churches, denominations, and ministries even put it down. They call it a scare tactic or even sensationalism. And what's more incredible than anything to me is they say they don't see it in the Bible. Obviously, you gentlemen, yours truly, I differ greatly with that sentiment. I'm very grateful, James, that you come along and you did this book. You've written it to those who are left behind, but it's a tool for now, for the believers today to give to loved ones or to have the book be discovered by loved ones. Am I correct? Yes. And I might say that there is a movement across America, as far as I can pick it up, and that is to reject the teaching that many churches have endorsed in the past, namely that that of the rapture. And it's unfortunate because Scripture is very clear on the fact that God is going to snatch away believers just before a period of great tribulation starts. And there are three key texts that support that. John 14, verses 1 and following, Jesus said, I'm going to come back and take you to myself. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, where Paul says, I'm going to speak by the authority of the Lord that Jesus Christ is going to come back and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and then those of us who remain will be caught up, instantly changed into a glorified body and taken to heaven. And the other key passage is 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul introduces that saying, I'm showing you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Those three key passages are foundational to an understanding of the biblical truth regarding the rapture. Millions, in fact, billions, gentlemen, are going to be left behind. Surely there will be multitude millions that are going to disappear. And at that point, there are going to be some who are going to be shocked. There are others, John, who are going to fall to their knees and say, why didn't I listen to so-and-so? There really will be a tremendous gathering in by God of the elect that are left behind in the immediate days after the occurrence of the rapture where none of the explanations are going to suffice for many that are offered by the world system. People will be coming to Christ in droves. Many of those will have heard of this event. They'll be attuned to as to what it really was. They will be more inclined to consider the realities of the gospel. They will be interested in finding out what they can of it, and that's why we're leaving it behind. What's going to happen is there's going to be a great struggle in many hearts between the rationalizations of the world system and secular thinking and secular worldviews and what Paul would describe as falsely called science versus the truths and the inescapable realities of what God has done in his actions. 
I want to play just a short clip. It's from the DVD we carry. Folks, we have two products for those that are left behind. One is the book we're talking about, Miss the Rapture, question mark, how to overcome during the tribulation. And then we have a DVD called After the Rapture, Left Behind. Both are outstanding for the left behind crowd. I just want to play a short clip from the DVD. Only the Bible has the truth about the rapture and what is going to come after the rapture. How do we know this is true? Because the Bible already tells us that this is going to happen. And this was written thousands of years ago. Only God sees from the beginning to the end and knows all things. Only God could have his prophets write down what is happening today, thousands of years in advance. One possible scenario is that there will be an announcement from the Vatican in conjunction with CERN and possibly even along with NASA, saying that superior beings that came to this planet thousands of years ago to seed this planet and to populate it have returned. The physicists from CERN using the Large Hadron Collider Particle Accelerator, under the guidance and direction from the astronomers at the Vatican Observatory, had indeed opened a portal and made contact with these superior beings several years ago. They will say these superior beings have returned to bring this planet into a new age of enlightenment. They will explain away the disappearance of the millions of people as those that did not fit into this new age of enlightenment, and that a global cleansing was necessary to rid the world of those who were not tolerant. Those that were against a single global governance, those that denied climate change and were against the worldwide implementation of Agenda 21, those that were against same-sex marriage and abortion and were intolerant of those who are a part of the LGBT community. Out of all the chaos and uncertainty going on in the world, after the rapture, a man will come on the scene, possibly even claiming to be one of the superior beings, and he will have all the answers to all the problems that plagued mankind for centuries. This man will bring peace to the Middle East. He will solve all the world's economic and social problems. He will usher in a one-world government and will, to the masses, seem like a savior for the world. Already, even before the rapture, as I am writing this, the world is desperately looking for a savior. The Muslim world is waiting and expecting their Mahdi, the twelfth Iman, at any time. Recently, one high-ranking Iranian parliament member went so far as to say, one can smell the end of times and the last Islamic messiah. Shiites, whose clerics rule with an iron fist, believe that at the end of times, the twelfth imam, Mahdi, a ninth century prophet, will reappear with Jesus Christ at his side, kill all the infidels, and raise the flag of Islam in all four corners of the world. Currently, Jews are waiting and watching for their messiah to return and help them rebuild their temple. In the last few years, many prominent Jewish rabbis are reported saying Messiah's appearance is near, and more Jews are calling for the temple to be rebuilt than ever before. If you join me late, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line authors John Balt and Dr. James DeYoung. Both have ties to Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Gentlemen, you heard that little clip talk about peace in the Middle East. I think you would agree with me, and I'll address this question to you, James DeYoung, and that is, after about three months now of the latest war in the Middle East, will Israel not be more ready, willing, and able than ever to not only be longing for that peace in the Middle East, but to accept that man with a plan who's going to come along and offer it to them? This is a very significant thing that is happening right now in the Middle East. I think the war that began on October the 7th is very critical in biblical and secular history, but primarily in light of the Bible and what it says. It is another indication of how close we are to the end, as prophesied in the Bible. Whatever the turnout of the present conflict is, it is a foretaste of the greater battle yet to come at the end of the tribulation, namely the battle of Armageddon. It is unfortunate that most Jews have no concept of belief in Messiah, they have not accepted Jesus as Messiah, but this is one of those things that I think God is using to prepare the Jewish people for the return of Jesus, 
so that they will long and hunger for deliverance and relief from him, especially at the Battle of Armageddon. So this is preparatory, an adumbration of what is to come. It is a spiritual battle, as much as a military and secular struggle for Israel's survival in the Middle East. John, you have a comment, perhaps, on the war in the Middle East. I think when it came kind of out of the blue back on October the 7th, as I have said in previous recordings, this is just phase one. They're going to move on to Hezbollah. They've got problems on the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, problems in Syria, problems in Iran. They have seven fronts they're dealing with as I speak. It's dramatically representative of the state of the world system. The world system is operated by the arch enemy of God, Satan himself. He is not only a deceiver, but a destroyer. As the most likely targets of his activities, he has two primary ones. They are the saints of Christ and the people of Israel, the chosen people, those who were originally given the promises, promises that I might say under the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant that still stand and have yet to be fulfilled. This violence represents a preview of the extremes to which Satan will use the world system and his minions here under the guise of political and ethnic rationalizations to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. It's a portent, as Jim likes to say, of things to come. I just want to insert a little bit here by Terry James. Terry is a good friend, co-editor of Rapture Ready website. We've carried Terry's books for years. Terry wrote this four or five days ago. I can't read the article. I can read a couple of paragraphs and let me do that. The article is titled Memorandum. Terry says this is a Christmas gift of forewarning. It is the order of terrible events prophetically scheduled to take place during the tribulation. The memorandum is given in love in advance for those who will choose, he says choose, to be left behind and after the removal of believers to heaven rather than accept God's grace gift of salvation. And now I'm skipping many paragraphs. The date of the memorandum is obviously unknown. It's to everyone left on planet Earth. It's from those who have vanished. The subject is the truth about what happened. And Terry goes on and he says, this is to tell you exactly what is involved in the sudden disappearance of people around the world. It's as simple as this. We who belong to Christ were called into the air above the planet in the rapture. Yes, that kooky, ridiculous, pie-in-the-sky, flyaway event that Tim LaHaye and other preachers of what you've thought of as a fantasy have been proclaiming could happen at any moment. Well, it did, in fact, happen. Terry winds down here again. I'm skipping much of it. You are hearing or will soon hear every conceivable explanation of what caused this astonishing disappearance. Here are our guesses as to what some of those explanations will be. One, it was some sort of a quantum evolutionary leap and will be ultimately a great leap for mankind. Two, there was mass abduction by extraterrestrials, an outgrowth of these singular abductions that have been reported over the years. Three, it was a natural, scientifically explained cosmic interaction that some human physiologies could resist. And he goes on with other things. I can't get into them all. It was punishment, removing the evil from the world. And then he concludes, don't believe any of these or other explanations to find out the absolute truth about what the mass vanishing actually involves. Read it in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, also read John 14, and find out where we who vanished are presently located. And then he concludes, now that we are gone and our leaving has everything to do with your immediate future, the following will happen in order very similar to what is listed here, and I can't get into all of those items. John, what is your reaction to something like this? I think it's very cogent, but if I might offer something, Jan, what you said in the lead-in to that reading was even more appropriate. You said that there was a choice not to believe. This is all an issue, particularly for people who've been exposed to the gospel and turned it down. It's an issue of procrastination, but procrastination is a choice. And in this case, it's procrastination over a choice that has eternal consequences. 
this really draws a heavy line under the word procrastination and the fact that it is moral and ethical responsibility not being pursued, rather moral and ethical irresponsibility being pursued, not to attend to the gospel and make the obvious choice for Christ that it entails. James DeYoung, you write that this event will raise questions for which the unbelieving world will have no answers. What do you think some of those questions will be? The most obvious is going to be where did everybody go, but what else do you think they're going to be asking? They want to know not only where did all these Christians go, but they'll want to know what's next, because on the scene will appear the Antichrist soon after and he will command the world's attention, and they'll want to know, well, is he legit or not? They'll want to know, how do we get delivered from all the suffering that is beginning to unfold? Where are we going to go for refuge? And, Jan, we speculated in our book by writing fictional vignettes Mm -hmm. that begin each chapter to hypothesize what kinds of questions people will be asking and how the Antichrist and his followers will be acting, dealing with the world. So that's another thing that encourages people, the common listener out there, as to whether or not they would want to read our book. These fictional vignettes help bring the book down to where they are. We're talking, folks, about the book, Miss the Rapture, question mark, how to overcome during the tribulation. And again, my guests who are the authors, it's written for those that you feel you're going to be leaving behind when we miraculously disappear in that incredible rapture of the church. Some things that are going to be happening, there's going to be a one-world government, there's going to be a one-world church, there's going to be a world leader from Europe will step to the forefront. Israel's government and Israel's enemies will sign again a peace covenant. About 40, 50 things are going to happen. The world leader will solidify his power following the Russian-led coalition's destruction. That would be Daniel 8 and other references as well. Meanwhile, God will put his protection upon the 144,000 Jews who have converted to Christianity. I can't get into everything. Let me play one more clip from the excellent little DVD. Again, we carry it after the rapture left behind. You can find that olivetreeviews.org as well as this wonderful book we're talking about. Today, the world is rapidly heading toward a global government and economic system. However, believers are hindering the emergence of a global government. After the rapture, when all believers have been removed and chaos ensues, a global Marshall Plan shall be implemented. Of course, the rise of a 10-region global government, followed by the rise of the Antichrist, will require time. Clearly, the Antichrist will not dominate or enforce a peace covenant until after the 10-region worldwide system is firmly established. All of this will take time. The woman of Revelation 17 rides the beast into power. She is one holding the reins at the start of this period. Therefore, it is improbable that the Antichrist will dominate and confirm a covenant with Israel and the world immediately after the rapture. The harlot's Babylonian-like religious system will come in Christ's name, not the Antichrist's name. She will present herself as queen of the true church, but she will be a seductive counterfeit, Clearly, the organizing of her global religious system will require time to set up. The two witnesses of Revelation 11 will preach for the first three and a half years of the final seven-year period. These men have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. This appears to coincide with the third and fourth seal judgments of Revelation 6 and the warnings of Jesus in Matthew 24, 4-7. through If correct, then the first and second seal judgments would occur before the two witnesses arise, which means they would have to happen before the final seven-year period. Again, a few years' gap would be needed for these early prophecies to be fulfilled. John, I think we are concluding that right after the rapture, during that time of Jacob's trouble, open-air preaching is going to be forbidden, and if anybody left behind who suddenly wants to start preaching, Bible-believing churches and pastors are not very effective. The members are gone. Access to solid Christian material is going to be very hard to get. We don't know the state of the internet during that tribulation. I'm No doubt it'll be controlled. 
So what would be very handy would be tools that my listeners and I leave behind. And I'm sure that's part of your motive. Hard copies. Think hard copies. I am becoming ever more skeptical. Uh, technology is rapidly becoming the primary means of surveillance. One of the things that's going to be surveilled heavily are going to be believers if they can be found. James DeYoung, my listeners would like the assurance that they are going to be departing in that rapture. I think we need to tell them how. We point out in the book, especially in the first half that John Bulch wrote, and I wrote the second half dealing with the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation as prophesied in Scripture. But the crucial thing is that people are prepared for the Lord's return at the rapture, and the only way to get prepared is to embrace Christ as one's personal Savior, which means simply to acknowledge that I'm a sinner, I need to be saved, I put my faith in Jesus Christ who went to the cross and died on my behalf, so that I could have peace with God and be reconciled to him. We talk about making a decision for Christ, and that's what is involved. John lays this out very clearly in the first half of the book. That's why other people have endorsed this book as something that ought to be in every Christian home, because it tells those left behind how to be saved in very careful terms, and also how to grow as a Christian, and in the second half, give the biblical understanding of those events that are going to happen in the future after Jesus comes. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for having assembled. I think it's a fascinating book. It's a lot of information for the left behind crowd. And all of you know someone you care about who's digging their heels in. They're not going to respond to the gospel, it would appear. We need to be leaving some things behind. Again, miss the rapture, olivetreeviews.org, go to the store. And then the DVD, same type of a theme, just in a different format visual after the rapture left behind. We have sold hundreds and hundreds of the DVD. I just think a lot of people are visual, but many just want to read what's going to happen, and you can do that in this wonderful book. Gentlemen, I want to thank you again for all you're doing. Say quick heads up here as I wind down part one of the program, and that is the YouTube audience. Remember, we now have had about 100 of our videos stolen, altered, and involved in some kind of a scam and this is common on social media, which YouTube is, please watch for subscribers. The Olive Tree channel has over 204,000 subscribers. All other channels are fraud. And I say to all of you, run from these. We're trying to protect you people from these online thieves, or just follow us online at our website, and then go to radio, or you could listen on Rumble, or our safer social media outlets like Truth Social or Telegram. Don't go away, folks. I've got Todd Hampson coming up. We're going to talk about some of the things going on in our world right now, and we're also going to talk about the Nonprofits Guide to the Book of Daniel back in just a couple of minutes. Anybody who's, you know, our age or around our age that, that has been really looking at things prophetically for 10 or 15 years or more. Uh, when you when you study what the 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 professionals, you know, the experts are saying, and I'm talking about like not, even non-Christian uh, economic experts, geopolitical experts, military experts, all of them have been kind of for years now saying there, we can't hold on much longer. Something, like you said, the dam's about to break. And when it does, it's going to be bigger and worse than anything we've ever seen. So that can be a little scary. But those of us who study Bible prophecy know, and I believe it's, you know, Second Thess 2, the, the restrainer has not been removed yet. I think if the church were not here right now, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit and dwell church, we're called to be salt and light. We're, we're doing just what we're doing here, Tom, and we're telling people about God's prophetic word. And I believe that is restraining evil. I believe that evil will crash in, the dam will break, and it'll it'll be un, unhindered completely as soon as the church is taken out of here. So really, when you look at things from a human perspective, it's almost like there's got to be some supernatural glue <laughs> holding yeah. everything together. There's a, there's a leadership vacuum in the world. Like you said, how much money can you spend before the bank goes bankrupt, you know, you, you can't go on too much further, but we, we trust God. And this is what I encourage people because it can be scary 
for people who are even studying Bible prophecy. We need to bank on the sovereignty of God and we need to trust God. Now more than ever, we need to put our money where our mouth is in terms of walking by faith, trusting God, knowing that he's a loving father and that it's his timing ultimately that's holding all of that back. He knows when he's when he's going to send his son to go fetch his bride. We don't. We live in anticipation of that and we can live in confidence that he knows just what he's doing. Welcome to part two of my programming, and I'm going to be joined in just a moment here by author Todd Hampson, because we do carry one of his more recent books, The Nonprofit's Guide to the Book of Daniel. Todd is a prolific author. He's co-host of the popular podcast, The Prophecy Pros, along with Jeff Kinley, and his books are unique in that they are heavily illustrated using the character of the nonprofit, spell that P-R-O-P-H-E-T, and we have carried a number of his books. We have another one. I'll say more about that later. I played a clip there of Todd on the Tom Hughes online podcast because he addressed a lot of issues of the day, and I'm going to talk to him about that as well. Todd, welcome back to the program. So glad you could join me again today. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Todd, just a comment here about our times, because that little clip that I played, you happen to be commenting on our times, and you and Tom referred to the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit in the church. Well, the church is going to be removed, but not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, and God is everywhere at all times present. Can you clarify that? I get a lot of questions about that. You cannot separate the attributes of God. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He's one with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so you can't take part of God out of the picture. But how the Holy Spirit operates uniquely in the church age is how he indwells each believer. So at least for a moment, every believer in the world will be taken out of here along with their salt and light that they have with them through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is a very important clarification. It's not that the Holy Spirit won't be active, because he will. He'll be very active in the tribulation period. But the Holy Spirit's restraining influence through the church will be taken out of here for a moment. We've come through an incredible year. We saw some things I didn't expect to see, and I just want you and I to compare notes, because I didn't expect to see in my lifetime. I thought perhaps this would happen more in the tribulation, which it will. And that would be vast portions of the world side with a bunch of brutal ragtag terrorists and denounce Israel. I didn't expect the world and many college campuses to demonstrate on behalf of the butchers of Hamas. And I said demonstrate on behalf of the butchers of Hamas, virtually calling evil good. Did that catch you off guard as well? Yes, it really did. I always expect to see some anti-Semitism in little pockets. But I always expect it to be quickly identified for people to side with Israel and against anti-Semitism. But in this case, it really did catch me off guard. Number one, the level of evil that took place from those who left the Gaza Strip and killed so many people and took them hostage and did so many horrific things. But on another level, one thing I did not expect to see is how globally anti-Semitism would be out in the open. Matter of fact, I have another book on the nonprofit's guide to spiritual warfare. And I talk about there's a collision of spiritual warfare, especially in the end times. And it does seem to me like we're at a different level. You and I have a good mutual friend, Olivier Melnick, who Mm -hmm. for years has been sounding the alarm that even though people have compassion on the Jewish people because of what happened in World War II, we're trending towards a time when there's an end times anti-Semitism or it will rear its ugly head again. And that's the thing to me that makes it clear that it's demonic, is that you have extreme right-wing Islamic teaching that's anti-Semitic, and then you have extreme left-wing progressive liberalism that is also anti-Semitic, and they're partnering together. To me, it's very clearly demonic in nature and has specific end times connotations. Yeah, Yeah, it's a spiritual conflict at heart. I'm concerned where the I don't like to call it a conflict in the Middle East. It's certainly a war. It's a very brutal war. I'm concerned where that's headed because I believe Hezbollah is next. I believe there are nests of terrorists in Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank. I believe that Israel may have to take some action in Syria. And then we have to ask, is Damascus or the obliteration, Isaiah 17, coming up in coming days or weeks or months? What about striking Iran herself, the head of the snake? As I speak, Todd, the news reports are saying that 
Israel is facing a seven-front enemy, enemy on seven sides of her right now, which is staggering when you consider the size of Israel. It really is. And to me, the biggest thing that it's setting the stage for, clearly in my eyes, is Ezekiel 38, where it says they will cover the land. They'll try to overwhelm them from the north, led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey, and some other nations that they're already partnered with. When you look at the world through the lens of our natural eyes, it all just seems like chaos. When you study it through the lens of Bible prophecy, all of those components are falling into place exactly like we would expect it to. And you're right, Jan, it seems like all of that could break loose literally at any moment, and we need to be praying for the peace of Israel. I want to get into a short discussion on the book of Daniel, more specifically, your book, The Nonprofit's Guide to the Book of Daniel, Bible Prophecy for Everyone. And to do that, I just want to play a real brief soundbite here of Pastor Gary Hamrick. And by the way, Gary will be with me on air in about a month. I so appreciate some of the teachings he has, and I'd like to set the stage with him. So really the book of Daniel can be seen as having two halves, the first half, chapters 1 through 6, the second half, chapter 7 through 12. And this is how it breaks down for you note takers. Daniel 1 through 6 is an historical narrative, and it covers the life of Daniel roughly 65 years from the time that he was taken as this Jewish teenager, as a captive of war, Uh, in 606 BC and transported from Jerusalem all the way to Babylonia where he is groomed as this advisor to the king and he will serve various kings over the next 65 years. That's chapters one through six. All this historic narrative about his life and his ministry. Then chapter seven through 12 is really a prophetic journal. Daniel is going to write uh, an addendum that he attaches here to, to his book. And so the last half is basically a large addendum. And it's a compilation of various dreams that God gave him and visions that God gave him of things that are yet to happen. And I'm talking yet to happen even in our lifetime. There are things prophetically here between chapters 7 and 12 that have not yet been fulfilled even in our lifetime. We're going to talk, talk about it today, but because of its high prophetic content in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel has often been referred to as the little revelation of the Bible. Todd Hampson, when I was growing up, I would hear, this is when I was a teenager and and even my early 20s, and I would hear that we're going to be having a series from the pulpit or in a Sunday school class on the book of Daniel, and I would cringe. And I said, it's not understandable. And since then, there have been many prominent studies on this book, and actually they've sort of come to life by maybe a dozen or so excellent teachers, but it's still, it has a bad rap. Many think it's way too complicated to understand. Not so, correct? Correct. And what a great synopsis that was, how he broke it down. The first six chapters are narrative, the second six are all prophecy. And here's what I love about the book of Daniel and why I want to encourage people to read it, because both of those sections are more relevant to us today than they were at any other time in history. The narrative section shows us how Daniel and his three friends stood for righteousness in a pagan culture far from God and how God used them powerfully in their day. So that gives us our marching orders for what lines in the sand we have to draw today and how we can rely on the sovereignty of God and take a stand. And the second six chapters are all prophecy, and they're relevant in two ways. One, because the fulfilled prophecies are so specific and so sweeping that they prove that the Bible is the Word of God. It's a built-in proof of authenticity from an apologetic standpoint. And also, all of the future prophecy that is yet fulfilled in Daniel, we see the stage being laid right before our eyes. In my opinion, the book of Daniel is more relevant now than it's ever been. There's even a verse in Daniel that talks about people going to and fro, and some people see that as travel. Others see it as that there'll be a time in the end when people will flip back and forth in the Bible, will run to and fro to figure out what the prophetic word is saying, because they're seeing so many things unfold before their eyes. That's another reason I think it's more relevant today than it's ever been. I want to get to that in just a minute, because that reference you're talking about also says the wise will understand. When a lot of people hear about the book of Daniel, obviously they think of the three men thrown in the fiery furnace or Who can ever forget Daniel in the lion's den? And there have been some movies made about Daniel pictured in the lion's den with a dozen lions walking around him and saying to each other, well, maybe tomorrow, but not today. We're going to leave him alone. Amazing scenes. 
But as you say, there's so much more to that book, again, that many people shy away from. Too complicated. Absolutely. Think of the fact he was taken in captivity as a teenager yeah. and lived there for over 70 years, the entire duration of the prophesied time that Israel would be out of the land. And he stood for the Lord and he outlived many kings. So yes, he did. It's powerful on so many levels. And it's 12 chapters. It doesn't take that long to read. There are some complex sections. Chapter 11 and 12 highlight some intertestamental prophecies and beyond that are, again, so specific that critics used to say they had to be fulfilled after the fact until we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls that proved it was already in use before many of those events. The critics don't even know what to do with it now, but there's so much built-in proof of authenticity in the book of Daniel. And also, people forget, it sets the framework for Revelation. If you really want to understand Revelation, you've got to study Daniel first. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Because some people, not only do they not understand Daniel, but they also find Revelation to be very challenging. So just clarify what you just said. If people try to study one or the other book, they do get a little confused. For example, if you go straight to Revelation, there's a lot of symbolism. There's hundreds of references to the Old Testament. So if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you're not going to understand some of the symbolism in the book of Revelation. Half of the meaning to the symbols are given in the context of Revelation, and the other half are direct allusions to the Old Testament, most notably the book of Daniel. So it's in the book of Daniel that we first learn about the Antichrist. There's several large sections about him. It's where we first learn about the specific time frame of the seven-year tribulation period. In Daniel chapter 9, in particular, we read about 69 weeks of years leading up to that final year. So 70 weeks of years that encapsulate the entire Jewish history from Daniel's time until the time of the end. The first 69 weeks lead up to the Messiah. Then there's this mysterious gap that we now know as the church age. But there's one seven-year period that is yet to be fulfilled so that's how we know the, the time frame for the future seven-year tribulation period. And then the book of Revelation is almost like you zoom into those seven years and you see the 21 judgments within that seven-year time period. It's kind of like the foundation and the framework of a house in the book of Daniel. And then in the book of Revelation, you get the drywall and the electrical and all the details. In most seminaries that still dare to teach eschatology, if you take a course on eschatology or revelation, they're going to teach Daniel right alongside with it. Okay. It really is the revelation of the Old Testament. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line Todd Hampson. We're carrying his book. You can find it in my store. You can find two of his books. The one we're talking about today, The Nonprofit's Guide to the Book of Daniel. And we also carry Chronological Guide to Bible Prophecy an illustrated panorama from Genesis to Revelation. And Todd's works are unique in that he's an illustrator, very, very fascinating illustrator. So everything he does is illustrated. And I think some of his products, because of the illustrations, would actually attract some younger people as well. I want to play one more clip, Todd. It happens to be David Jeremiah. And he has a series on Daniel online that is second to none. He'd given him an outline for all of world history from Babylon all the way to the coming of Christ. That's why this dream is so important. All of the rest of the prophecies of the Bible just fit in the empty places in this massive dream. So Daniel's done. He's finished. He's told the king this dream. The king's kind of recovered a little bit from the shock of it all. And Daniel 2.45 says, The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. And what Nebuchadnezzar does next is nothing short of astounding. Verse 46, he praises Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and an incense to him. In other words, he thought Daniel was a god. He wanted to worship him. Of course, Daniel wouldn't have anything to do with that. The next thing that happens is Nebuchadnezzar praises Daniel's God. One thing to praise Daniel, the human in front of you, but he got the message. There's something going on here beyond just Daniel. And notice what he says in verse 47. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. When Nebuchadnezzar says that Daniel's God is the God of gods, what he's saying is, next to my gods, your God is the real God. I got all these silly, sorry, unproductive Babylonian gods. You got a God. You got the God of gods. He was convinced. You want to comment on that, Todd Hampson? Yeah, I actually do trace that in the book. There's three different times when the Lord is clearly drawing King Nebuchadnezzar. And each time he gets a little bit closer. He moves from overt, complete polytheism and pride to respecting Daniel's God. When I read it, I don't see 
concrete evidence that he ever crossed that line of faith and ever worshiped God as the one true God, or whether he just saw it as the strongest God of all the polytheistic deities that he worshiped. But that's going to be one interesting thing when we get to heaven. I want to know if King Nebuchadnezzar actually became a believer or not. I pray he did. But it's interesting to see that even if somebody is far from God, pagan worshiping polytheistic religion, that God still wants a relationship with them. I'm transitioning here just a little bit to Daniel 9, 26 and 27. I think those are two key verses in the Bible. Talking to others, teaching as we do, Israel is a setup right now as we speak sort of long for peace more so than any other time in their modern history. They have never had peace in 75 years, and a man is going to come along and offer it to them in Daniel 9, and that person is going to be the Antichrist. He's going to make a firm covenant with Israel for seven years, then he's going to break that covenant in the middle. Why don't you talk to us for a moment or two about that, because it's so important that we understand that Israel has had to be in a stage-setting situation for her 75 current history years to the point where after five and six wars, she wants a covenant with a man who's called Mr. Fix-It more than anything. So true. You can very clearly see the stage being set from that. And I always encourage people to study carefully Daniel chapter 9, particularly the last four verses. Verse 24 gives the overview of the entire 70 weeks. Verse 25 covers the first 69 weeks, the time from the rebuilding of the temple to the time when Jesus came. Verse 26 is that mysterious gap where we know the church age exists. Verse 27, and I'll just go ahead and read that, says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. It talks about this evil end-time ruler who will be a Mr. Fix-It. He'll confirm a covenant. I don't think it's coincidence that every U.S. president since Nixon has had some kind of peace agreement between Israel. And as you mentioned, Jan, that Israel really has never had peace in her modern existence. She's had military strength and she's had protectors, but has never had peace. And we also find in Ezekiel and a few other places that when Israel comes into their land again, they come in first in unbelief. And that's what we see today. Most people in Israel are not believers in Messiah. They are awaiting the Messiah, even though he so clearly has come, but they're looking for a political solution, somebody who can bring peace out of all this turmoil. And everything that we're seeing today is further setting the stage for that. And you could see after the rapture, in the midst of that chaos, how someone could rise to the fore. And that's what we read in the book of Daniel as well, that that one ruler will spring up and take over three nations in this post-rapture world and will be so charismatic that people are drawn to him, and he will have a game plan to make the world, and particularly Israel, think that he can broker peace finally for Israel, which they'll maintain for three and a half years, and then he completely flips and goes after them and tries to destroy the Jewish people after that three and a half year mark. What we're talking about, that would be the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, Some people call it the tribulation followed by the great tribulation. That would be the times of the Jews. We are currently in the times of the Gentiles. That is two distinguishing periods of time that are very, very different. Why don't you give us a couple minute explanation of that, Todd? That's another layer of teaching in the book of Daniel. As a matter of fact, it's written in two languages. For the sections that are written to the Jewish people, it's written in Hebrew, and for the Gentiles, it's written in the Gentile language of the day. And that's where the framework for the times of the Gentiles is. It says, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that's another area of teaching in the book of Daniel as well, is there's this kingdom context. The vision in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 highlight four successive Gentile kingdoms of the day and a revived version of the Roman Empire in the last days. And they're all Gentile kingdoms. In chapter two of the book of Daniel, we see that in the vision, there's this rock of unhewn stone that comes in and destroys all of the Gentile kingdoms. It's almost like God is sovereign over all the Gentile kingdoms, and eventually he's bringing in his kingdom. You know, there's so many prophecies in the Old Testament about this future kingdom age where the Messiah is going to rule from Jerusalem. We believe that takes place after the tribulation period when the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom. To fulfill that prophecy, we see so many tie-ins here in the book of Daniel about 
clearly laying out the times of the Gentiles, followed by this time of the future kingdom when he will rule from Jerusalem. I find it interesting that the tribulation, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not called the time of the church's trouble. Daniel's 70th week has nothing to do with the church because it's designed to bring Israel to faith, not to punish Christians. Absolutely. The book of Revelation in particular is so Jewish, and it's a stark difference from so much of the other books in the New Testament because it ties back into the Old Testament. Even just looking at the character in that book, you have 144,000 Jewish witnesses, two Jewish witnesses who come at the beginning. You have God's focus returns to Jewish people. And you got to tie that in with the minor prophets as well, the book of Zechariah, where you find that the Jewish people call on his name. We just celebrated Christmas time. Even looking at some of the early portions of the Gospels, Mary was told, you will name him Emmanuel. He will save his people from their sins. And Jesus in his ministry, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. His focus was on the Jewish people until they rejected him. Then that opened up. You read Romans chapters 9 through 11. Paul explains how that allowed us, thankfully, to be grafted in. But there's coming a time after the church is taken out of here when God will return his focus on the Jewish people to win them to himself. It's very clear in Scripture. You have to do mental, logical, and theological gymnastics to avoid it. So Daniel 12, heavily verses 8, 9, 10, 11. I'll just read a couple of them here. As for me, I heard, but I could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the time of the end. Many will be purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Or some versions say those who are wise will understand. I believe this implies that there are going to be Some who are absolutely going to understand the outline of the last days. There are many who will not. Why don't you comment on that? Because I just think that verse, again, Daniel 12, verses 8 through 11, are so important because we're in a time, Todd Hampson, where finally people are understanding the plan for the end of the church age and the end of the age. Like no other time that I've ever seen or read about in church history, Everything is making sense. And if you study church history, you can understand why Israel's in the land again. So that's a fulfillment of prophecy. All of a sudden we realize, okay, Bible prophecy is literal. Therefore, the future prophecies are literal. So that should help us see it. But as you often mention, Jan, matter of fact, you call your radio program Radio for the Remnant. Even though we want every believer out there to understand what's going on right before us, it seems like they're blinded in some ways. This verse highlights that fact that many won't understand, but those who are wise will understand. I believe that's in the church and outside of the church. Obviously, non-believers, we don't expect them to understand the times, but even some of them are waking up and asking the big questions. And I believe we can leverage that and introduce people to Christ and let them know the Bible does have answers to the chaos that we're seeing in our times. But in the meantime, we also have to try to wake the bride at large. So many churches just will not touch Bible prophecy. So many churches won't talk about what's going on in Israel right now, even though it's directly related to Bible prophecy. We need to have a revival in the evangelical church where people are willing to preach the word from cover to cover and look at the world through the lens of Bible prophecy. The Nonprofits Guide to the Book of Daniel, olivetreeviews.org. Go to my store, olivetreeviews.org. Todd Hampson, thank you for all you do. As I go out of the program, let me just say a couple of words, because the Book of Daniel says that when it comes to the issues of God's plan for the end of the church age, as we just said, only the wise will understand. And we have tried to equip each listener with the knowledge and insight to better understand how God will wind history down as we know it. Is the fulfillment of that 100 years or 1,000 years ahead or a few minutes? Scripture says that it could happen today. That is why we exhort you to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Romans says all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. I want to thank you for listening. We will talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444.
44. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. Nothing is out of control because God is always in control. He has planned and orchestrated all of human history. We have a front row seat to the final acts in the drama of life as God allows events of the day to transpire so that everything can fall into place.